Today, we're talking with winter finch expert Matt Young, who is also president of the Finch Research Network. We asked our viewers if they had any questions about winter finches or eruptive species, and in this segment, we ask Matt those questions. I'd like to move into the like, kind of the Q and A section of questions that people had. Um, so the first one is, uh, what does an eruptive species mean? So what what is an eruptive species? All right. So eruptive species is generally kind of a species that has you know kind of this unpredictable. Uh, migratory behavior, you know, that shows this unpredictable migratory behavior. So they erupt, you know, out of the boreal forest into areas, you know, at certain intervals that are not necessarily all that predictable. Um, And so there's like eight of these in Eastern North America that are typically, you know, defined as eruptive finches. Um, and that's, you know, the, the pine gross peak, evening gross peak, the two crossbills, the two red poles, pine siskin and purple finches. You know, they, those, num- those birds, you know, the ranges in the wintertime are incredibly variable from year to year. And it's all somewhat driven by, you know, high population numbers and available food sources. And if, the, if you're in an area that you've had high reproductive success for a number of years. And then all of a sudden you have a poor food crop and you can't support that crop, you know, that population, then the birds are forced to move. So eruption is like eruptive migration is really a kind of, it's a facultative migration, meaning that it, you know, it's waterfowl are the classic example of facultative migrants. They move because the water freezes and they are forced to move. And with finches, they move because literally, you know, the food source in an area can't necessarily support the population level. Does that yeah. makes sense? Yeah, I think that was a, a great um, definition of it. Yeah. Um, moving on, somebody said, maybe it's just me, but they don't seem to be erupting as much in the West. So they're saying they don't see as much of an eruption in the West and they wanted to know why that might be. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things with the Finch Research Network, we've been trying to kind of, you know, write more and more about the West. And the West, it's, you know, it, it's a more complex dynamic out there, or, you know, it's, it's a challenging landscape to kind of predict eruptions because topography plays a huge role in the West. And so, a lot of the eruptions out there are less, often less broad scale. Like in the east, we don't have mountains at, you know, 13,000 feet. So they tend to be more localized elevational eruptions that occur where they'll move down mountains into the villages or little, you know, mountain towns and stuff like that. So that's part of the reason why, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's rarely ever as pronounced in the West. Um, And it's because of largely topography. Um, But the, you know, they're getting in on the fun this year. I mean, they have, there's plenty of eruptions going on. Like, you know, Lawrence's goldfinches, you know, moved from California into Arizona and, and uh, even some records in Texas, you know, and red poles are now in Utah and in the Rockies and white wing crossbills erupted. You know, Cassin's Finch is the classic one that I just was kind of describing where they're more of a, this elevational gradient to some degree or, or movement from a, 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 an area in the northern part of the range into a southern part of its range. And some of those have moved out into uh, the plains. There was that amazing record, first state record in Michigan, was it, a few weeks ago of Cassin's Finch? Uh, I think... Uh, yeah, could be. Yeah, it was Cassin's Finch. There was a Cassin's Finch first state record in Michigan about three, four weeks ago. That makes me feel like they've definitely got to be some in Wisconsin. Then people I probably mean, just are thinking they're purple finches. I would imagine. Well, that's just it. Yeah, how yeah. many Cassin's finches get just played off as? Oh purple? yeah. Ryan and I were talking about it the other day. How if you weren't looking for Cassin's finches within purple finches, you'd just be like, oh yeah, that's purple finch. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Uh, awesome. Moving on. Um, the nesting procedures of these winter finches. The nesting procedures of these winter finches. So, 
you know, I mean, most of them are, you know, they nest like most other passerines in the summertime. Although crossbills, um, even though in the literature it says they can nest at any time of the year, that's not really all that accurate. They do nest at two cycles, two, two pr primarily two cycles in the year. One is uh, in July, August, September, when they're utilizing newly formed cone crops. And then they will nest again January to April into May, early part of May, when they are utilizing the last remaining good cone crops. Um, the other birds, you know, evening grosbeak, pine grosbeak, you know, they're all red poles. They're all, you know, kind of summertime breeders. Um, they're nesting July, August, you know, June, July, August, like any other. Siskins, Siskins can nest as early as like early March, you know, and they could raise a couple different, they could raise a brood and then move somewhere else and raise, and raise another brood. So yeah, that, I imagine it'd be difficult because a lot of the species act like more nomadic to have a nest. And then if your food runs out, kind of be out of luck. So when they nest, they have to make sure they have a solid food, you know, solid group of food around them, huh? Yeah. I mean, finches are always following resource availability. I mean, any bird does really, if you, but finch is a little bit more of an, on a dynamic scale, um, you know, not so much just individual basis, like, you know, I mean, they're obviously, um, finches are social, so they're in flocks. And so they use, you know, information from one another on when to move and when not to move. In fact, flight calls are often, you know, if you look at a flock of finches, Usually what happens is, is they build to a crescendo, you know, right as they're about to fly off. And what they do, what happens is the flock will be feeding and a couple birds will call. And then, you know, if that, if other birds continue to start to join in that calling, what they're basically saying to each other is like, hey, we're not, a lot of times we're not feeding that well right now. So we need to move. Um, you know, That's of course, crazy. there must be so much different communication that those birds have. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, I mean, if there's a raptor in an area, they're going to get out of Dodge, too. But um, but that's kind of the whole I mean, that's how they keep flock cohesion is that flight call. Sure. Awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. We kind of talked about this already, but what are other predictors or causes of eruption besides weather and food sources, if any? Weather and food sources. Well, you know, I mean, spruce budworm is certainly a big wild card in all of this. Um, you know, in the last five years, there's been some generational cone crops on spruce and tamarack. And then obviously we've had this blossoming budworm outbreak in Canada and, or well, in Quebec and Ontario that's, you know, helped with reproductive success. Um, there are, you know, um, I think you said climate data. So, I mean, long-term cyclical nature of, of temperature and precipitation certainly play a role in the cyclical nature of, of cone crops or in food crops. So there's not necessarily other things other than you can sometimes, and I think this is just kind of being redundant a little bit is you know, you could have a localized or a widespread freezing rain event that could push, you know, birds out of an area. And feeders could even kind of keep birds from even erupting, you know, out of the out of the north to some degree. If they, you know, if you have a small eruption in a year of evening grows peaks, they might not, you know, actually make it into the states because, you know, they just found a little village with a bunch of feeders to the north. So sure. I think that kind of answers the question. Yeah, it's yeah. Well, um, largely driven by food and weather. and. Yeah, this, so this one's loaded. It's how to differentiate the calls of finches. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, I think what I could say is, everybody, please go to the Finch Research uh, Network website, finchnetwork.org. We just released a few days ago uh, uh, an Eastern audio primer on finch flight calls that everybody can go to and use that as like a cheat sheet 
on how to tell the flight calls apart from one another. And we're currently working on a Western one as well. So please go there and support us if you, uh, if you uh, are are feeling particularly supportive. Definitely. Um, We had someone who said house finches are underrated. Do you feel like house finches are underrated? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I do. In some ways I do. I mean, they're, they're a fascinating species in that, you know, there were only a Western species to begin with um, that, you know, they were released in the East, um, you know, several decades ago and that population expanded and uh, you know, the population is contracted a little bit because of conjunctivitis, but you know, the, that Eastern population you know, first off, they're beautiful, but I'm obviously biased. I love all my finches. Um, but, you know, second is, you know, what's fascinating is, is the Eastern population, you know, they aren't necessarily eruptive, but they have clearly now documented their migratory nature of house finches in the East and maybe even in the West. I'd have to, I'd have to look in that a little bit more, but um, yeah, no, they're, they're, uh, in fact, they seem to be around more this year than I've seen them in a while. There's some pretty good sized flocks around, uh, in New York. I'm in upstate New okay. York. Yeah. So. Definitely. Well, that's all we had for the YouTube questions. And I think with the eruption, like people are, you mentioned your story last time about your first experience, getting to see like these nomadic birds and being captivated by them. And I think a lot of people are being able to experience that for the first time and are also getting captivated by these birds and wanting to learn more. So it's great that you guys have all these resources for people to use now. So thanks so much for doing that and uh, for talking and answering people's questions today. Yeah, absolutely. At any time, guys. I mean, I, you know, I love coming on here talking to finches, you know, some, you know, and my passion for finches never wanes really. As you know, um, my voice might go, but not my passion. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. Yeah. Thanks, guys.